The next reason is simple. It will not be rushed. The <laughs> and it stopped again now to look. I'm like, oh, oh, it's looking again. It's looking again, guys. It's, it's, it's still spazzing out the corpse. I can't find match. What? The game crashed. It will not be rushed. The game crashed when I tried to play multiplayer. The game actually crashed when I tried to play multiplayer. Look, look at the KD, by the way. They've taken away... They've... they've they're, they're at a 1 to 5 KD at this point, the enemy, enemy soldiers, despite being surrounded and everything. And even when they're routing, they're not being, they're not dying. Yep, even when they're routing, even when they're routing, the hit points are coming in and they're not dying. They are actually going to run through my men, thanks to the hit point system. They're, they're actually almost managing to run through my men here. Holy crap, they are running through, look at this, they... They are running through my own men because they have they still have the hit points, okay? It's like it's allowing my soldiers to actually kill them. And they're gonna get out here mostly intact. What's up with all these weird interactions? You can thank one of the many changes made by Rome to just a hair over 10 years ago, whose design forms the blueprint for every total war since health bars. If you want to know why combat in older titles felt a lot more decisive, whether it was the avalanche of casualties resulting from a charge or the withering effect of arrow fire, then look no further than the shift from the old hit point system to the health bars introduced by Rome 2. I feel this shift in the design doesn't get nearly as much attention and coverage as it should. Instead, people focus way too much on the engine change made in Empire Total War, and I say too much because Napoleon, Shogun 2, and Fall of the Samurai proved that while the engine may not be very good, it also doesn't have to be a death blow for the series. After all, Shogun 2 has pretty clunky melee combat, with soldiers shuffling about and the spear wall formation being quite finicky. But the important thing is that actions had weight to them, and don't think I'm saying that in a subjective manner. 20, 30, in extreme cases more than 50 men would die to a charge. If you ever played a multiplayer match in Shogun 2, you will be very familiar with how scary a unit of no dachi samurai or shogatai can be. And you could be sure that routing men would be slaughtered if attempting to route through enemy soldiers. I will not call such a system perfect. I would prefer if routing soldiers actually did retain some ability to fight back, so as to prevent a single unit of light cavalry from effortlessly cutting down hundreds of enemies. In fact, this was the system in place in the original Shogun and Medieval games. The problem in Pharaoh, as with every game stretching back to Rome 2, is that it is neither of those systems. Routing soldiers possess no ability to fight back, but at the same time, thanks to health bars, your men are going to have a difficult time cutting them down. It not only looks bad, but actively harms the gameplay. You now have to tie down however many units to ensure that the routing soldiers don't rally. Especially important if this is an elite unit, when you might need these men elsewhere on the field. In what is supposedly a real-time tactics game, the player should be rewarded for putting the enemy in a bad position, where they have to fight uphill against superior numbers while being surrounded. But that just doesn't happen. Instead, you will find yourself bringing the highest quality units you're capable of recruiting and smashing them into the enemy. This has been the case since Rome 2 and became only more pronounced with the single entity spam that has plagued the Warhammer titles and even supposed historical titles like Three Kingdoms and Troy. I can only aptly describe it as being akin to a child slamming two toys together. Unit quality, a major component of which is how much health a unit has, has been determining the outcome of battles almost to the exclusion of all other considerations since Rome 2. However, I've already demonstrated this on more than a few occasions in different videos, which I will link in the description. Instead, I'll be focusing more on what Pharaoh does, 
or attempt doing. Warhammer 2 is best because content in DLC. Fair or bad because no. I like how I like how you we 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 took the same approach where we just repeat the same phrase in every box. Yeah. You know how many you times get... I say the word content? Because that's all they talk about is content, content, content. And it's just like they're just begging, fleece me, daddy. Fleece me. Make me make me pay for every faction. Make me pay for every single unit if needs be. I just want to pay for the content. Pharaoh, in the interest of historical accuracy, does away with cavalry units. Instead, raiders type units, who are basically fast moving infantry, take their place, whose implementation is poorly done thanks in part to their larger unit size compared to cavalry in other games, and which is compounded by the health pool system and the buffs granted to the AI on higher difficulties. Difficulty modifiers for melee have been plaguing the combat since Rome 2 driving players towards playstyles heavily reliant on ranged units, single entities, and cycle charging to make use of charge bonus. It was always crap, but those games at least gave you a method for cheesing the AI by engaging in hit and run tactics with cavalry. The lack of cavalry in Pharaoh takes away one of the few options the player had in overcoming the nonsense buffs the AI is endowed with. There is so little you can do in battle, to mitigate the losses of your own men while exacting a heavier price from the enemy. The core principle of military tactics. CA has already done an infantry centric total war game and done it well. Follow the samurai. While cavalry feature prominently in multiplayer, the campaign will see the vast majority of your units be infantry. What does it do different? Fall of the samurai was the last game in the series where morale truly mattered. Basic levy and line infantry would waver and rout when subjected to a few volleys of fire and a charge by your melee infantry. You could effortlessly rout a whole stack with just a few units. Clever usage of terrain made that possible. It was also the last game in the series to use the hit point system. Every model in an infantry unit had a single hit point. When attacked in melee, a soldier would either dodge or parry the blow or take the hit and die. Damage under the system was lethal, unlike the later games where men slowly chip away at each other's health bars. As in the example of a routing unit pushing through my men while barely taking any losses. Thirdly, Follow the Samurai didn't confer any special bonuses to morale or melee whatsoever to the AI's units. They did get buffs to accuracy and reload rate, but engaging with firefights in that game is rarely a good idea, anyway, because of how slow the replenishment is. Your goal is to put the enemy in such a spot that it can't bring most of its guns to bear, so the buffs to ranged units don't have much capacity to harm the gameplay. The infantry-centric combat works, overall, because unit quality is only one factor among several that you will be taking into consideration. CA has been incentivizing players to use autoresolve more and more, and based on my experience playing Pharaoh, where raider type units are so obnoxious to deal with, necessitating the sacrificial use of your units, they seem to have completed that task. The best way to deal with the AI is to let the game do it for you, and it's particularly effective with ranged units and chariots. Tosret has such a strong campaign start because she starts with two chariots. Chariots, oh dear. What are you there? What are you guys even doing? They're just ignoring the chariots, they're going for the general? <laughs> okay, that's funny. It's like a stage play, like they when they get knocked over, it's like, oh it's like it's like they're not actually getting impacted. And they just turn around to what, what is what is going the gods have what, what was that weird 360 oh that's the collision thing because these other guys are getting collided so this causes the other this causes them to act weird every problem with the game's battles is on full display with chariots the models collide into one another while moving 
not even in combat yet. And when they do enter combat, they just softly slap against the target unit, stopping dead in their tracks. I know that most likely the developers wanted to ensure they weren't overpowered, but this is more than a slight overcorrection. Total War has always in some way or another struggled with modeling and balancing its more mobile troop types, be it cavalry, war elephants, or chariots. My biggest gripe with all of them is that they never properly simulated the psychological effect that the mere sight of approaching cavalry has on infantrymen. Humans, after all, don't respond very well to large objects moving towards them at high speed, especially when it's accompanied by an increasingly loud, thundering noise. If you were to ask me, the Total War game that we never got would make lower quality levy and militia units break formation and waver in the vicinity of enemy cavalry, before we even consider the physical damage caused by the charge itself. This was already technically done to some degree with the dread trait for generals in Medieval 2 or the war slaughter trait in Shogun 2 which caused a morale debuff to nearby enemy units. The same would apply to chariots. These are an exotic military unit and it isn't hard to see the terror they could strike in enemy soldiers, particularly in those who had never encountered them before. Chariots and Total War Pharaoh are an interesting case study in the major problems riddling the series' combat system, and in all of the missed opportunities. It has been over 20 years since Shogun Total War stepped onto the scene, setting itself apart from the combined city builder hard counter combat of Age of Empires and Starcraft. With combat simulating morale and the effects of terrain, and featuring multi-entity units, and yet, as the series stands now, it has gone nowhere but backwards. The one positive thing I can say about the battles is that the AI actually has some capacity to search the field for hidden units, and can even remember where units were last visible. This may have actually been a thing in Warhammer or Thrones of Britannia, but regardless, this was the one part of the battles where the game didn't completely fall flat on its face. Yeah. Get so all these features yeah well every, every time they're just adding they've got so many features so many mechanics it's just always just multiple sub windows that just make numbers go up and then and even then like you have all these brackets over here like this province i'm on the full screen over here um you got this like brackets like melee defense on recruitment plus three like that sounds significant right like that sounds like it's gonna be like for the whole faction just in general because that, that was something that existed in past games as well. Like you'd get um, plus one to experience to like all spear wielding recruits, like whatever they're recruited. It does this over here and it's like another bait and switch. Like, sorry, just sorry, brackets. It's this province only. <laughs> it's not. <But> it's <laughs> Fine print. <laughs> right out, right in. I'm telling so, you, oh, it's, it's, it's middle management. Middle management designed this game for middle management. They love reading this <laughs> crap over here. <laughs> Same thing, uh, damage resistance versus missiles, this army, it's like all of it, like this province, this army, this, same thing with the tech tree, like, there's this like big text over here with the bonus written, and then this tiny, tiny like footnote thing over here that says, only four temples. And of course, the biggest layer, the Bronze Age Collapse. If various cities called Pillars of Civilization, which are dotted around the map, are destroyed, the condition of civilization worsens, so more frequent earthquakes or debuffs to resource production, and the wave after wave, of course, of dangerous raiding Sea People's armies. Now, this all sounds really, really good all right. on paper. And it uh, okay, so, pause. So, how, how is this... Let's, let's play into this whole like historical versus fantasy red herring. How is a city being destroyed going to result in more earthquakes or like? I didn't even I didn't even catch that. Like he says it like all so quickly that I didn't even register that. Like wait a second. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is so this is Creative Assembly's first historical game, um, and. In all honesty, I would say when it comes to historical versus fantasy, let's say grounded versus. A much hyped aspect introduced by Pharaoh is the outpost mechanic. Every region has a few set locations where you can construct an outpost, 
which can be described as a sort of mini settlement that can provide bonuses ranging from resource generation to replenishing army movement, depending on which you choose. It's a neat idea that flops in its execution. For one, it's a shame that the outposts can only be built in predetermined locations. It really is crying out for the ability to place them at will. Up to a certain number in the region, of course, and according to your strategic considerations. Secondly, you may have thought to yourself that the replenishment to an army's movement range would lend itself to exploitation. And that is correct. Strategy games tend to work better when you have to plan carefully and commit. Um, being able to shift your army from one frontier to the other, or from your heartlands to the frontier, somewhat contradicts that. The military outposts also provide their own garrisons, which sounds reasonable enough. But the problem is that attacking the main settlement means that you not only have to fight the garrison within the main settlement, but also the garrison provided by the outposts in addition to any military units that the AI has recruited. So you will almost certainly come across a scenario where you have to fight not only an army stationed in the settlement. And remember, even if you put a full stack into the settlement, you still get access to all of the free garrison units, unlike in previous games or in older games where the game would not provide you those free units if you took up the slots, which only exacerbates a long-running issue since Rome 2 where the defender gets far too much of an advantage, far too many resources at its disposal, especially when you factor in the combat bonuses that the AI gets. So whereas if the game was well designed and you could easily take down two stacks with one, this would not have been too much of an issue. It's far, far more difficult and far, far more annoying when you factor in the difficulty modifiers. And it just reinforces the meta of getting the highest quality units and doom stacking to expand your empire. It doesn't help that such outposts are available early and relatively cheap. They're a no-brainer. Another problem is not unique to outposts, but extends to the rest of the building and tech tree. The overwhelming focus on stat modifiers, many of them passive. The technology tree is particularly riddled with incremental stat buffs, which is not only difficult to parse, but also not very interesting to engage with. I've said it before and it bears repeating. Fall of the Samurai brought us the best building trees and tech progression the series has seen. Almost every military tech was unlocking a building and some units. Revolver cavalry tech unlocked the unit of the same name. Explosive shells unlocked explosive shells for warships. Arms deals unlocked skirmishers and so on. There were some passive stat buffs among these military technologies but they were usually secondary to the unlocked buildings and units. On the economic side, technologies did provide several stat bonuses, but these were all quite substantial rather than small incremental improvements. When it comes to the buildings, almost every building line gave you access to a unit or agent. Cadet schools, for example, are incredibly potent as they not only give you access to line infantry, but also spawn a single unit of expendable line infantry during siege defenses, greatly improving the area's defensiveness. In order for a building or tech tree to not feel like bureaucratic busywork, it needs to have clear, decisive effects on the game world. A bunch of techs that give plus 5% or plus 10% to stone generation or wood generation or more XP gained per battle just do not hit in the same way. Rather than unlocking strategic and tactical options, each with their own opportunity costs, you're simply amassing more power for yourself. Finally, when it comes to outposts, it bears mentioning that they are not even an entirely new feature. Empire Total War introduced villages that you could improve and provided their own variety of bonuses. Granted, in that game, they didn't interact with armies outside of being raided, but let's be real. They are not breaking new ground here at all. CA seems to be hoping that most players they are marketing this game to have no experience with the series prior to Rome 2, which is the game that got rid of many of the changes brought about in the Empire, Napoleon and Shogun 2 era, and ushered in the systems that are still in use to this day. 
yeah, something like that. Something yeah. crazy. Like uh, that. How, how does people. something like three hundred dollars sound for EO four or something? You get all that yeah. sweet, sweet, sweet content. You know what you get for oh, your content. your 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 hard earned money? You get the the cool. I still remember that mechanic to this day because it turned me off the game. Okay, the cool estates mechanic where keep in mind this is eu4 where there's like like a thousand like provinces on the map or something or a thousand two hundred and each province has its own estates that you assigned it you have to go manually clicking on each and every one trying to balance numbers over here you want to make sure there's like four estates and you want to balance them so that not one of them becomes too powerful if they become too powerful there's like they're they're gonna try making demands and then maybe a civil war breaks out or something the problem is, okay, oh, it's it's easy to balance it out, right? It's just easy. You just, you look at the percentages and you just balance them out. Cool. You spend 10 or 15 minutes balancing them out. You hit the, the play button because the game, you know, you can pause it and give orders. You hit the play button after doing that for 10 minutes. And then you get a random event that gives 10% to one of the estates. You know, just a random fuck off event that gives a 10% and slides them into the too powerful category. And now you gotta go removing territories from certain estates or from them to give to other people. And it just it's just constant like hamster wheel kind of crap. It's just that. That's yeah. what I'm Total War players want in to uh, sorry, Warhammer Total War or Total War players generally now, the current ones want from their Total War game. They want that. They want Total War Pharaoh. That is the end yeah. game. <laughs> to demonstrate that's how that's far the series has fallen, I won't compare Pharaoh to Shogun 2 or Rome Total War or the original while, uh, Shogun Total War. Even the most running. casual of Total War fans will have a positive opinion of those titles. So, of course, okay, Pharaoh okay. won't hold up very well. That's why I will compare it to Empire Total War. Yes, the Empire that released in March 2009, marred by optimization issues, clunky collision, and bad AI, the latter two of which linger to this day. For all its problems, Empire had a functioning morale system. While the gameplay was more focused on ranged combat, flanking, rear charges, envelopments were all still potent tools that any decent player will make an effort to use. The game far surpasses Pharaoh in the efficiency of its interfacing. Gunfire is clearly audible even at a distance, while projectile trails are very visible. You don't have to rely on the unit cards nearly as much to monitor the state of the battle. And what's with all the Zs on the unit cards? I know what their purpose is to signify that a unit has been idle for 30 seconds or whatever, but what, what even is the point? Has the APM burden? The emphasis on kiting and cycle charging and giving constant attack orders because unit behavior is so simplistic and dumb that the idea of leaving units in reserve is completely foreign to Total War? The answer is yes. The developers seem to have looked at Age of Empires, where villager inactivity is a major indicator of a player's planning and micromanagement, without understanding that villagers are resource gatherers in that series. In every decent Total War game, it was common to leave units idle, be it ranged infantry performing area denial, or melee infantry sitting in reserve, ready to rush over to a given trouble point as the state of the battle changes. The way morale functioned meant that piling units into a blob or engaging in a general offensive would get punished by even a moderately competent opponent. Even the AI could deal ugly damage to your troops by sitting its units on a hill, if you chose to charge it head on. It's just my onions! <laughs> it's my just my... I, I, I believe that everyone is entitled to their soup, okay? <laughs> <laughs> From the very first day of release, and in many ways before, the commercial failure of the game was already apparent. How did we even get here? I don't normally talk about sales numbers in my videos. I prefer focusing on the game's own merits. Hell, the main game I feature on this channel, Shogun 2, was not a commercial success in its time. But in this case, I have a strong interest in the financial performance, and it might not be for the reason you expect. Rome 2 broke pre-order records, but it proceeded to damage the long-term viability of the series as is apparent in Attila's poor commercial performance. Many fanboys will claim that Warhammer saved the franchise, but let's not kid ourselves here. 
The main appeal of the Total War Warhammer games was the Warhammer aspect, not the Total War aspect. We have definitive proof of that at this point. Every single game that lacked the Warhammer IP since 2018 has been a commercial failure to varying degrees. Three Kingdoms was an exception in its initial launch success, but CA squandered that game's potential with lackluster DLCs and their official cancellation of the post-release support, including the final DLC just two years after the game's launch. Troy had an epic exclusivity deal that no doubt gave a healthy sum of cash to CA, but even though the game was given for free on that platform, whatever popularity it achieved did not translate into more activity for the other titles. Giving games away for free is rarely altruistic. It's usually just another form of marketing, a free gateway into the rest of the series where the money will be recouped. Thrones of Britannia, Troy, Rome Remastered, Three Kingdoms, and now Pharaoh are all languishing in obscurity. Most of these games are competing and in some cases losing to older titles like Medieval 2 in a popularity contest. The fact that they abandoned nearly everything that gave their games merit for the goal of widening their appeal, or more specifically, appealing to the so-called Total War fans who spend every waking hour on forums, and only failed, is embarrassing. Also, the forums. I find it annoying and concerning that the biggest gripe people seem to have with the game is the lack of factions, such as the absence of the Assyrians, in addition to the game's pricing. $40 is still too much, so is 20 It's insulting to even ask for money when this is yet another reskin of Rome 2. I haven't focused at all on the lack of factions, because that is not addressing the fundamental issues, the shallow, uninteresting tech and building progression, and the absence of any tactical depth from the battles. An additional faction that does nothing to address the core issues is not the answer. The serious inability to see the real problems is not surprising. Bad business practices attract bad customers at low standards, after all. After years of normalizing poor value DLCs, their remaining customers can only look at games in terms of the amount of con, tent, how many factions, how many units, how many regions. It's bean counting all the way from top to bottom. You can even see this number crunching bean counter mentality taking hold in the modding scene for some of the older games, like the expanded maps for Rome 1, adding hundreds of regions without any regard for how this might impact the balancing or gameplay loop. The campaign customization really drives home the idea that Total War is now being designed for your average forum poster, the kind of person who only ever plays the campaign on normal difficulty, auto-resolving everything and treating the game as a city builder. The options to start out with fully decked out generals, prevent the AI from engaging in its own diplomacy, even outright toning down the severity of the natural and sociological disasters, in a game that had the Bronze Age collapse at the center of its setting and marketing, all of this seems to have been deliberately designed to shield players from any consequences while they create memeable clips. Could you imagine if the Mongol invasion for Shogun 1 allowed you to disable the Mongol invasion? Or if the Barbarian invasion for Romon allow you to dis disable the Barbarians? I despise the way Endless Customization, or Faux Customization, has become the standard for the strategy genre. It gives off the impression that the devs lacked a clear sense of direction or vision for the game, so they proceeded to offload that decision to the player which also gives fanboys the opportunity to discredit anyone criticizing the game by saying, well, maybe you can just try different di settings. Uh. The best kind of customization is giving the player more agency in how they approach the game. Shogun 2, for example, features a religion mechanic that most factions can almost entirely ignore for the duration of the campaign. With two exceptions, all factions start out adhering to Shinto Buddhism the majority of the provinces as well. This religion is basically a sort of easy mode. You don't have to invest much, if at all, into converting provinces. You don't have to deal with religious unrest, meaning you can expand more quickly in the earlier phases of the campaign. So why would you convert your faction to Christianity then? Christian factions gain access to the non-bond trade ship. 
one of the few cannon bearing ships in the game that also has a large crew of musketeers. It's an amazing ship to have for transporting units quickly and maintaining a sort of colonial empire. The religious agents, whether Buddhist or Christian, also have an insight revolt action, which if successful will spawn an army of religious rebels in another faction's province. The catch with this action is that it is far more likely to succeed in provinces that have a different religion to your own. Or, in other words, because most provinces are following Shinto Buddhism, Buddhist monks are going to have a harder time spawning rebels than Christian missionaries. Finally, Christian factions can import firearm units twice as fast as Buddhist clans. These are capable of delivering decisive morale shocks and gunning down upwards of 500 men in the siege defense. Effectively, the game is presenting you with two routes with differing difficulty. The Buddhist clans will have a much simpler and easier early game, while converting to Christianity will slow your expansion down in return for powerful gunpowder units on land and sea, and the ability to bring factions to their knees without fighting them through the use of missionaries. And this decision is yet another layer to the other basic considerations. What text to research, where to expand to, which provinces to develop, and so on. It is not about presenting you with 30 sliding scales in a menu. You might think this is all a terrible way to design a game, and it indeed is, but let us not make the mistake of thinking CA is in the business of designing good games. They are not, and they have not been for around a decade. The way they moderate their forums, where for years there was an endless deluge of low-quality Warhammer memes and DLC speculation and hype posts, is proof that they are in the business of selling you a community experience. Their business model preys on that desire to identify as part of a community, making use of that to drive up sales. If you do a bit of digging, you can find posts and comments stating how they would buy the DLCs for a given game, the stated reason being their desire to support the company. It reeks of performative behavior to signal in-group membership. This works with Warhammer thanks to the weight that the IP has, but they seem to have made the mistake of thinking people care about historical Total War, outside of a loud minority on the internet. Not done yet, though. There's still one thing that to leave out feels almost irresponsible. That is the complete 180 that many of the Total War YouTubers have made in their coverage of the franchise, amid Pharaoh's release. I will use Andy's take as an example here, but make no mistake, he is not the only name on the shopping list of people who spent years hyping up new releases in a manner reminiscent of a pump and dump scheme only to do an about face and position themselves as the voice of the community. Let me be clear. I have not and do not consider myself a voice for the community or even for the people who watch this channel. If they happen to agree with my observations, then I trust they will have come to that conclusion themselves and not just parrot whatever the hell I say. And you certainly don't get to position yourself as such when you played an active role in running this franchise to the ground and ensured that long-running issues, issues stretching back to Rome too and in some cases even further, would never be resolved. We once got full-on expansions that contained whole new campaigns with their own unit rosters, buildings, and tech trees, with Medieval 2 Kingdoms and Follow the Samurai. We basically got full games for the price of half. We don't get that anymore. And part of that is because these YouTubers were happy to give away their channels as marketing platforms, hyping up games and DLCs of questionable value for as long as they felt the arrangement was profitable. Total War Warhammer is now a thing of the past, and CA can no longer bank on a lucrative IP to sell their games. Pharaoh reaffirms what some of us already knew, that there was no money to be made in, quote, historical games that lacked the Warhammer IP, and it seems that many of these YouTubers have come to realize that too, if they hadn't already known that earlier. Some people will claim that I'm saying that people can't change their minds about something. That is a complete misrepresentation of my point here, which is that these morons are hoping, praying, that you don't realize their sudden switch in tone, trying to rewrite their own history. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if they switch right back to shilling if a Medieval 3 is announced. Really dedicate their free time to not just play, but add on to and develop your games for you through mods are who matter here. And finally, if I hadn't said it before, listen uh, to your audience. Okay. The same audience that for more than a decade has called for a return to depth to every little gameplay detail that make up what you... No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They were fucking shilling yeah. this shit from, 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 from east to west. No, yes, they weren't. that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, he's acting like, he, like, I've been critical I, all I, this look, time. Look, 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 little, little history over here. When I, like, between, like, 2011 and 2019, I would, like, every six months or so, I would go back to Shogun 2 just, like, to binge play it or something. And I, in my free time, I would also go hang out. Think, you know, maybe check Total War Reddit. And I literally had to scroll down for like one minute through Warhammer memes just to get through anything that was not the Warhammer meme. Literally. Yeah. Where? Where? Yeah. Do you see these people? Where are they? I don't see them. I'm, uh, I've always been critical, guys. Promise that's getting checked off right. What is up, guys? Welcome to a pretty ad hoc video. A response to... Uh... Uh, Andy's recent video titled uh, In Defense of Total Warfare or Response to the Haters and uh, got my little notepad over here because he has some things to go through, some things to grade you on, Andy. But let's begin, shall we? Let's look at a bit of criticism. I find this base um, in ignorance. But they don't, they don't say that. They just turn around and act like they were him. Total More time critical of the series. No, you weren't. <sighs> you weren't. And games to Liar! <laughs> yeah. Do you know who they remind me of? Do you know who they remind me of? You know those terrible Hobbit movies? Yes, of course I know them. You know, you know the little green. You know the yeah, the, 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 the guy, the, 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 guy. The, the, the town, the the Lake Town guy, the the Lake Town, lake town the, guy. The, 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 the second that, like command. sucked up to the mayor. He sucked up to the mayor for ages, and then when the mayor eventually fell, they were like, he was like, three cheers to Bard. Everyone, we love Bard, don't we, guys? Bard's great, and <laughs> that's them. Wait until Medieval 3 comes out. Play 